I'm going to read a little bit from The Ungrateful Refugee, which is my memoir and book of nonfiction. All a memoir. There, are, It's kind of threaded with um, some essayistic portions and also stories about other people um, as they interface themes that I talk about in the book. So I'll read to you a little portion, which is really about my grandmother. And it's about it happened when um, just before I was about to go to a refugee camp in Greece to do a little bit of reporting. I wanted to experience a refugee camp as now, and it was the very first time I'd visited a refugee camp since I lived in one. So it was a very scary moment for me in my life. And, um, uh, you know, I had been uh, invited by a charity that was going to allow me to speak with all of the Farsi speakers there. Um, and it, it, it formed the basis for a lot of what I wrote in this. You know, an incident happened just before I left that I want to read to you about. Um, Dina, um, Dina, this is Heather. Before mm -hmm. you begin, um, if you could just slow a little bit, because there is sometimes a little bit of a gap um, because of the technical issues from your village in France where you are. But if yes, you, of course, if you, I think if you if you slow down the normal pace a little, that that might help us. But it's sure. fine. But that's just okay. a suggestion. And don't worry oh, about no, of the time. Course. Just do what do what you do. We're happy to hear from you. Okay. 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 Of course. Thank you. And and I um. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you guys later about the village in France. <laughs> so, the night before I fly to Greece, my grandmother, Mama Moti, called. She tells us that she has no place to sleep. Her apartment in South London is no longer a refuge. The neighbors are trying to drive her out. I don't have to ask what they're doing. I ask the first time they're making noise or smoking, bad behaviors that may have nothing to do with my grandmother, but are nonetheless believe annoying. It's the waves again, she says. Started sleeping in the attic, it's very cold. My grandmother and I only reconnected a few months ago after a seven year silence. She is an immigrant too, having taken my mother's sister, the youngest of children and run away to London before the revolution of 1979, before my birth, when my mother was in her early twenties. The family story is that she left my father who had never been faithful to join another man, another's teacher, to plan to start a new life with him in London. In a grimy corner of the city, she found a flat, a school for her 12-year-old daughter. She had brought a little money. She was young. Married off to my grandma 13, she had given birth to my aunt Sohela at 14, then to my mother, Sima, at 16. By 27, she had my uncle Said and Aunt Sapide too. By 30, daughters stood as tall as She competed with them for clothes, for admiring looks in the street. In the year I was born, as she sat by the phone in that London flat, perhaps looking up English words she had seen on a billboard or in a magazine, was 39. I was her second grand. For a week, Mama Moti waited by the phone, by the door, suspended between lives. Had she, left, had she left after the revolution, she ended with her countrymen in a camp. He didn't come. He didn't call. She waited. Maybe she called her family in Iran. I'm not privy to the details. I do know this. After any hope of his arrival was gone, she continued to wait. At that, though she wasn't a refugee, she succumbed to the habits of one. She became addicted to waiting, to hope of rescue. She gave her mind up to it. Bart describes waiting, this one Bart him early, describes waiting as both delirium and subjection, illness and torture. My grandmother has become permanently delirious, a servant to her waiting. She could have stepped out of her marital dreams into London, a free city full of the things she had once loved, poetry, stylish clothes, music. Instead, she found to extend the waiting. She took the name Emma, the first of a thousand small adjustments to make herself palatable to the English. She styled herself the English way, fine-tuned her accent. It isn't anymore, but something in between and very fine. She found a church in a well-to-do neighborhood. It wasn't so well-to-do. It didn't have a lot of immigrants. She decided then and there that she wanted nothing to do with the past. 
She didn't want to be defined by divorce or by displacement. Certainly, she didn't advertise that she had been a child bride to an almost child groom, less grotesque, but no less traumatic. On Ivoti's wedding, she knew nothing of sex, not even that it existed. They told her if not married, she could wear high-heeled shoes, and that's all she knew. When she, first her, when she felt her first moving, she thought it was a snake. Or... Then she met Christopher in a singles group, or maybe it was a parents group. They must have smiled, paid her a compliment. He took her hand and told her to be strong, not realizing the frailty of her immigrant heart. Somehow in that hour, one more tea. Sorry. Are you, can you hear me? Where was I? Oh, in that hour, Mama Muti heard God's voice, a promise. He told her that she would marry this man, that they would a new life, that all her scattered children would be brought together again in a great house in London where she would serve the best Iranian dishes on antique Wedgwood, where well-heeled daughters, thin and elixes, would serve her still marriers' husbands, having not wasted their hard-won Ivy League degrees on middling right career, sit her at her waiting for wisdom. <laughs> Bring her melon and mint in a glass with the long. In my fantasies, Mama Moti is always asking for a long spoon. Probably a broad, broad memory. I work it back in this way or that. All she had to do was trust. Trust and wait. Nowadays, actually, can you guys hold on one second? All right, I'm going to remove headphones and put in a charger because I just got a warning. Uh, <laughs> the amount of charging. Is that okay? Can you still hear me? Yes, we can still hear you. Okay. Thank you. That's me. Like bar swinging, she sees Christopher in the street, in the faces of passersby. Later, she cries that the man who glanced up from a newspaper in the park and who held to the supermarket was her betrothed, waiting for her to acknowledge him. But she had forgotten his face, and so she has failed. He is disappointed, heartbroken. Each morning she sits in a park stricken with unreality. She writes poems, letters, family histories. She signs them Emma and mails them to him. He never writes, but, but they aren't together. Someone collecting them, these precious family stories, my inheritance. Wish I knew Christopher's last name so I could search for them. He is married now. Maybe he has moved or died. She waited for Christopher for roughly three decades. How many times she fantasized about the house, the dinners, the return of prodigal children. She experiences the waiting no less urgently than those in camp, though hers is invented. She lives in it still. She is no less crippled. Every day, life's smallest choices, travel moving, or moving churches are made unthinkable by the remote possibility that today an answer will come. Meanwhile, she craves drama to hide the around the waiting. Years ago, Mama Moti confided in the fact that certain members of her church are affected by the certainty she has of her future. The, shirt, the church has divided into factions. There are political machinations of much like the early day church. She prays, she asks for us to pray. Arri arriving in London, she had a small bundle of money. She bought a flat, prizes. A, decades ago, a, decade, a few decades ago, her feet began again, another symptom of the exile disease. But she didn't visit it. They have hired the downstairs neighbor to drive me out, she told her daughter, now to the very offspring she had once craved, a Londoner with a pale blonde husband and three tall, handsome sons, dream in English. And then friends from church came around, but all Moti saw was that no one believed her. Each time she sold a flat, she lost around 15,000 pounds, moving to a slightly less desirable location. Each time, after a few years, the neighbors began to conspire again, sending smoke to her home, vacuuming at night, children to scream and fight in the yard. She moved again and again, always writing Christopher a new address. In each new flat, her hope returned for a time. The itch in her brain calmed. Maybe this would be the living room where Christopher would sit, 
where she would bring a cup of tea, where he would take her hand, I'm sorry you waited so long. In 2011, when news reached the family that I had moved from my home in Amsterdam to some workshop in Iowa, Willip, and later when we decided to divorce, Moti stopped, scream, stopped speaking to me. For her, Philip was proof that even though her daughters had fallen into exile, her granddaughter hadn't. Philip was white and handsome. He made money. His feet were rooted. What more could a silly immigrant girl want? Besides, Jesus did not allow divorce, and she wished to know. In 2015, I became and moved to London. It took two years of living in her before she contacted me. Maybe it was Elena, her great granddaughter, or Colonel, plan my mom or aunt, uh, telling her that my new partner Sam came from a good family. He was an artsy version of Philip, much better suited to me. That he had graduated with a first from Oxford, so let him and bun. Him for having those curls after forty. His mother was a faithful Christian too. Did she know? She's like Philip's mother, but an artist too. Finally, Mama Moti phoned. When she did, I was angry. I didn't want to welcome her back. How dare she for the very thing she did at my age? How dare she abandon us in Iran for an English life and then judge us? And how dare she refuse even to sponsor us out of the refugee camp? We were in limbo without an inkling of our future. We could have ended up in rural Australia or deported back to Iran. No one speaks of this part, but Mama Muti could have brought us to England. Why didn't she? Then there's her casual sexism. To my grandmother, an unmarried woman is wasted, and so she is in a perpetual in between, a time between marriages. Being manless is the same as being stateless. If you have no husband, even if it takes 40 years, you are only waiting. By hurry, the night I'm prepared for Greece, my true return to Barba, that's the refugee camp. After the fall of 2011, Moti and I have had a handful of visits. We dream aloud of bringing family together, maybe a reunion. What can we do to convince everyone? We scheme together. She is kind, but lives entirely in her own invented world. She glimpses out at us from inside, but mostly she's decorating corridors and rooms inside her mind. I understand her more than anyone else in my family. This me, age. I can see her struggling with the age. In me. I can see it just as clearly as I see it in the mirror or in my daughter when there's an extra fold in her tights or when one arm of a sweater is tighter than the other. When I am mother's age, Will the itch open up, reveal a fantastical universe full of church espionage and radiation guns? And when Elena is her age, will she too invent a home for her? Are, are there things that I have rejected because the itch wants me to be ever on the move? At 9.30 p.m., we're still waiting for Mama Moti to arrive. I am furious. This trip is full of small ironies. Our sofa will arrive while I'm gone in our home. It seems ugly to reach the final after decades of wandering, just as I'm visiting the freshly uprooted. Elena is asleep. I expect that Mama Moti will call the station, but she doesn't. Instead, she gives my address to some strange mocks her to my flat. Sure, at 10 p.m. I hear her chirping gratefully at the man. I never see his face. We were robbed two months ago, so I grow nervous and then livid. God sent me an angel, she trills, takes off her boots. Don't give my address to strangers, please, I say, instead of welcome. Then quickly I add, welcome. We make tea for her. What happened, I ask. They're sending waves again, she says with a long eye, as if she were telling me the dishwasher is busted. I can't sleep. I feel it poisoning me. They turn on Jean and I get headaches, nausea. The downstairs neighbors are sending leaves up through the floor of her flat. They are radioactive or electromagnetic, who knows? She feels them in her body, inside her head. It makes her heart flutter. She gets palpitations and shortness of breath. 
In the evenings, a low-grade buzzing starts up and keeps her awake until, or until she gives up and moves to the sleeping bedding. If anyone visits the neighbor to turn off the machine so that they can make her look crazy. I ask if she's seen the machine. She dismisses the question. It's large, aimed straight at the ceiling through her floor. What if it's not radiation, but an allergy, I ask, or anything else in your body? I'm not sick or crazy, she says, sipping tea. She said this so often. I ask her if I can come and see her flat. She says that they never send the radiation if someone else is in the flat. Someone else stays while you, what if someone stays there with you for a while? I'll just finish this bit. I say, she perks up, then I have an answer. How could I have missed it? I can call a friend an amnesty, I say. Refugees are always looking for places to stay. I can find someone young and strong and you'll have someone to watch over you. It's a win-win. Her calls. I don't get involved with refugees, she says. I don't want to have to do with any of that anymore, no. I remind myself that she was forced into marriage at 13. That she's now losing her grip of reality and has reason to distrust. We make her a bed in the living room. She thanks us and goes to sleep. In chaos, we make breakfast. We feed a lay and dress her for nursery. I pack my suitcase. I'm so nervous. Here I am about to visit people who have lost their homies, young mothers, own travelers, and elder couples who live in metal boxes, people so displaced they can't even imagine the landscape of their future. A majority will be depressed, some suicidal or drowning in fantasy, and I can't even handle my grandmother and her inhospitable flat. And what a waste. Passport, a place to live. The doors were open for her. She made her self into me. I'm late for my train to the airport. I decide to run ahead. I kiss them goodbye. We watch we our coats, our shoes. Elena says, bye-bye, mommy. See you next week. My, my chest tightens. She's paranoid to see you next week. But what she means is, see you tonight. Moti chuckles at Ellen's English accent. She's darling, she says. As I'm leaving, I see Moti struggling with her boot. She leans against the wall, taps her purse, checking for something. She says, Dina Jun, bring me a long spoon. I freeze. Then I run a dinner spoon. She plunges it into her boot like a shoehorn. Thank you.